sorry. I think I don't know if everybody heard that announcement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, where she taught all educational functioning levels at the community college there and developed contextualized, content-based, and English for specific purpose courses for students and an online professional development course for faculty. Currently, Rebecca is collaborating with several colleagues on second language writing projects. She's a co-investigator on a longitudinal multi-cohort research study on the writing development of Chinese L2 college writers. Along with Joy Creed Payton and Kirsten Schetzel, both of whom have um, provided us with professional development and webinars and discussions on the, teach on the teaching of writing, uh, Rebecca has been conducting research with these colleagues, co-publishing and developing professional development on adult ESL writing. Her recent publications include a survey of writing instruction in adult ESL programs, or teaching practices meeting adult learner needs with Peyton and Schetzel that was published in 2017, and we have made this publication available to all of you, and Artifacts and the Agent, Translingual Perspectives on Composing Processes and Outputs with Campbell and Koo, and this publication is in press. So as you can see, we have a wonderfully uh, gifted person with us today. So I'm um, de definitely looking forward to our presentation this afternoon. A warm welcome to Rebecca Fernandez. And please everybody join us on Monday and Tuesday where Rebecca will be facilitating a discussion to follow up on today's webinar. So welcome, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Susan. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, how writing in general can be sort of a springboard for teaching so many other skills. Um, and that's why it's called uh, writing as a basis for reading and so much more. Um, the questions we're going to address are as follows. So first, how does writing contribute to second language acquisition? Second, how can we support how can we teach writing to support reading and speaking? How can writing support grammar and vocabulary learning? And then finally, how do we motivate students at all levels to write? First, why don't we focus more on writing? And, and I, by we, I mean those of us in adult ESL. Um, I know that from the survey that um, Joy and Kirsten and I did, we know that, uh, and, and from our own experience in the classroom, we know that time and planning demands have a lot to do with it. Teaching writing takes a lot of time. Um, we know that the priority that adult ESL programs give to reading and speaking also has a lot to do with it. Not just the programs, but we know the students also, they, they want to speak especially. Um, and so that also feels like it's, it's, it's like it competes with writing. And then of course, assumptions that we have about language learning. And, and in those assumptions, oftentimes writing seems to be the least, you know, sort of left behind. Um, so what I would like to do next is to make a small, a short case for why writing does contribute to second language acquisition and why writing or how writing can be used not to take away, but to, to enhance second language acquisition. Um, so I start with just a little bit of theory. Um, so we assume that writing instruction takes time away from the focus on other ostensibly more important skills, but writing is not just useful for its own sake. It's also, it also contributes to language learning in general. Uh, writing is a form of language output, which as researchers Meryl Swain and her colleague Sharon Lapkin have contended, sometimes under some condition, writing facilitates language acquisition in ways that are different from or enhance those of language input. So you might be familiar with the idea of comprehensible input and how important that is to learning. And what they argue and what I also argue is that that one another dimension of learning has to do with output and that writing is part of that. And as as output, writing is similar to speaking with the added benefit that it allows language to be slowed down and analyzed in ways that natural speech does not. So when we're speaking, everything's going too fast. We can't stop and study and revise. Um, and this slowing down helps learners notice both the meaning and the grammatical structure of their language products, the thing, what they're saying. 
Um, writing also provides students with opportunities to apply and continually refine their knowledge of English as they negotiate meaning and try to communicate their ideas to others as clearly as possible. And finally, writing instruction and peer conferencing activities around writing, especially, um, also help students to learn meta language. And that's how people talk about writing and how to interpret and give writing feedback to others. So how might we teach writing to support other skills, especially reading? Um, and the other modes, you know, uh, listening, uh, speaking, etc. So we know that writing and writing instruction can support second language acquisition from what I said earlier. Still, adult ESL instructors are not required to teach writing, right? Most of us weren't, at least when I was, I wasn't required. Students are expected to acquire strong reading skills and either specific content knowledge or the ability to learn content from text sources. Um, to address these concerns, we can now ask this, this question of how might we teach writing to support reading. So um, just as input is enhanced by output, reading skills are made stronger by writing and vice versa. So technically reading and writing are not parallel processes. This, this, um, this uh, visual aid here, it may look like it's parallel. They're, they're related, they're analogous, but, but they don't, they don't uh, proceed in a, uh, par in a parallel fashion. Technically, reading and, fa and writing, they're, they're, they are interdependent, though. Um, so this visual model helps to illustrate this interrelationship at all stages of literacy. So if we start from the bottom, uh, we can say that whereas reading involves decoding of letter symbols and sounds, writing involves encoding through handwriting or typing and spelling of those sounds. And then if we go to the next level, in the next level of processing, New readers extract meaning at the sentence level from text, whereas writers will, would construct meaning, uh, their own meaning, by producing sentences of their own. Uh, then we move up. Next, learners move to discourse level for processing of text. So as they read, they begin to form a mental model of the ideas that they're trying to develop in their text or, or that others are trying to develop in the text that they're reading. And then in writing, they are able to demonstrate their understanding by summarizing or explaining a particular concept or making inferences um, from those texts that they have read. And then finally, at the highest level of processing, um, students can interpret and evaluate readings in writing through argumentative writing, critical analysis, through clarifying ideas, etc. So it, it's important um, to keep in mind, though, that this is just an idealization. In real life, these, these things don't proceed, you know, in this sort of hierarchical fashion where, you know, you, you can't decode, uh, you, you can't interpret if you can't decode. It's much more complex than that. Um, so although reading and writing can support one another, they, um, they don't develop concurrently. So you have to, for example, um, you sometimes have a language learner, with adults especially, you have a language learner, who can read and infer basic meaning from a text, but whose grammar is so limited that they're not able to write a clear sentence about that text, right? So that, that will happen with adults. Um, and conversely, that student may be able to produce a grammatical, well-written sentence through, let's say, dictation, but yet not understand what it means. Um, so it, maybe for children, it's a little bit more predictable, this visual, but for adults, we know that it's very, very messy, that the processes are messy. But I'm showing you this graphic so that you know what all the components are and that you understand that when we teach writing, we have to keep all of those in mind. Um, in adult ESL, what we typically see is that at the lowest levels, um, I'm sorry, that, that, that lower level and higher level uh, processes of reading and writing tend to line up with educational functioning levels. So if you attended the first webinar in the series in which um, Joy, Person, uh, Joy Payton and, and Kirsten Schetzel and I discussed the findings of our adult ESL writing survey, you might remember this chart. So it features a breakdown of skills respondents told us they emphasize because most of their students lack these um, at each EFL. So it should be no surprise, for example, if you look at at the, in the blue, um, that in levels one to three, these students need more help with basic spelling, word order, subject verb agreement, whereas those in the pink, in levels four to six, 
uh, need to develop discourse level and extended writing skills. No surprise there. Be that as it may, we should encourage adult ESL instructors at all levels to tap into the other components of reading and writing presented in the previous slide. So beginner level students may need more basic grammar than those at the advanced level, but their writing should not consist only of exercises and note taking, which is something we found in our survey as well. Similarly, more advanced students may be able to produce longer writing, but you know they might still need explicit vocabulary and grammar instruction. I, when I taught advanced levels, sometimes you know when, when they test, they might test right into a, a level three, level four, maybe five more or more, and they may they may test that high for, with a writing test with a reading test rather, um, but they they may not have the ability to produce the vocabulary and the grammar that someone at that level would be expected to produce. And that's where you have to provide that explicit instruction um, that one might expect the, you know, a, a student at a lower level would be getting, not a student at such a high level. So what we suggest uh, about the connections between reading and writing is borne out by research. So um, I'm not just saying that it's connected because it seems like a clean, you know, sort of a clean thing uh, construct for the teaching of writing. There is evidence for this. Um, in their 2010 report for the Carnegie Corporation, Steve Graham, who does a lot of wonderful work on the connections of reading and writing, and Michael Hebert offer what they refer to as long needed guidance for teachers and policymakers by identifying specific writing practices that enhance students' reading abilities. The first activity type that they found from their research um, that works very well to support the, uh, writing, I'm sorry, reading, so the writing, writing activities that support reading uh, involves explicit teaching of lower and higher order processes. So what we talked about earlier, what I mentioned earlier with the visual that has you know, the, the circles at the bottom and the circles at the, at the top, you wanna always incorporate both. Um, they specifically mention process writing, teaching text structures, teaching paragraph and sentence construction, and spelling, because these specific activities do impact reading skills positively. So, um, you know, we, we assume a lot of these, for example, process writing is something that those of us who went through the American system know um, almost implicitly, but we have to teach those, uh, those processes to our students explicitly. Um, one way that I teach that combination of lower and higher order processes um, comes directly from the work of Jerry Graff and Kathy Birkenstein. They have a book that currently a lot of first year writing faculty are using all over the country called They Say, I Say. Um, it's written for mainstream competition, composition students, but um, I think their suggestions work with ESL students, native speaker students, in, in, in just about anywhere. Um, I think it's very helpful because it really it, it, it really spells out what you're supposed to do um, to accomplish. So at, at the sentence level, what you're supposed to do to accomplish this sort of rhetorical aims that you might have in your writing. So um, they contend that academic writing can be learned by mastering certain rhetorical moves. So that's the ways that writers use language to accomplish certain ends. Like, for example, um, like this chart shows that you can introduce a standard view like when you start a paper you want to have some kind of context and that's context can is what we might call introducing a standard view um and then after you you know give that context and what people generally believe you then move into what your position is so do you agree do you disagree and so and then they also they give these templates for how you might do that and then um to support whatever claims you make you want to have support and so um, the table provides these examples of frames that can scaffold students' ability to make, you know, to, to accomplish the, the introduction, the position taking, the supporting of evidence, et cetera. Um, so if we're trying to help, let me just sort of go through it. So if you look at the first one, let's say we're trying to help a student get started on an opinion piece, for example, and we might start suggesting, so we might start by suggesting or by modeling, let's say, I often will do this. First time around, we write together, I model what we're going to do. So I might start with, 
the example here. I might say, okay, we're going to write, you're going to write a personal essay about the importance of, of college or of higher education. And let's, you know, provide a, a, an opinion piece in response to some kind of reading that you give them. So the it might start, the essay might start with something like, Americans today tend to believe that, and then you work with students to try to figure what that is. So, so maybe in this case, as an example, that a four-year college degree is essential to success. Um, then you move on, okay, to help them understand how to construct a thesis or a, a position statement, we might provide the templates in the second column. Um, so to agree, disagree, or any other way that they wish to respond, right? So um, here, for example, I might model the sentence, okay, so um, to, to, to take a position based on that standard view, we might then say, I disagree because um, one can have a good life with a two-year degree. So having made such a claim, I might then move to the template to teach the student how to provide supporting evidence for that uh, by way of examples. So I might model or have students help me complete another template by looking up supporting evidence online or in whatever text they read. and um, or, you know, and maybe using their electronic devices to look something up. Um, and I might say something like, so this one I found online. So, for example, dental hygienists can make more than $70,000 per year and so on and so forth. And, you know, you can get a dental a hygienist degree at a community college. So, um, so, so suffice it to say, you can use these, these templates or something like this that you can come up with yourself to scaffold students writing and at the same time you know not only help them develop the, the parts of an essay as they should be but also learn how the specific language that needs to go into it because oftentimes it's they may want to write a thesis but they don't know where to begin so this is a way to do it so for the second set of writing activities that improve reading as recommended by graham and hebert um they, they talk about writing about text. So they could recommend talking about text. So this is a defining feature of academic writing. What distinguishes it from other types of writing? Um, personal writing, creative writing, that's not usually something that is standard in, co in, in college, right? And writing about texts is. Um, summarizing, so writing about text will involve summarizing, responding with your opinion, answering a specific question about a text, uh, even learning to annotate or to take notes on a reading. All of those are, are important and they can be effective writing activities that support reading. Um, one activity that touches on several skills at once is collaborative peer review. So here I'm using it as a way for students to practice analytical reading and write about each other's texts. So, in this activity, students are writing about about text, but it's each other's text. It's not somebody else's, you know, like some expert or published piece of writing. Okay, um, collaborative writing is also an excellent way to develop speaking skills and academic vocabulary. Um, in this particular activity, the teacher hands out a classmate's paper, and of course, well, not of course. If you want to, you can remove the name of the writer. It just depends on the kind of uh, classroom culture that you have. I mean, some students would not want their name their, their name on their paper, and some students, you know, are fine with it because they're comfortable with each other. So it depends. You have to make a judgment call there. Next, is the teacher introduces students to the components of a peer review. So you have to teach that very carefully. I do that with every level of student that I work with. Um, you um, and I have come up sort of with a, a heuristic for doing that. You teach them to provide feedback with this little acronym. So first, when you provide uh, feedback, you want to recap. So summarize the writer's aim, um, which is, you know, initial R. Then we can move on to A, applauding, meaning pointing out what the writer does well. Then we move on to the next piece, which is now giving advice or what they're not doing well. So for recommending, offer suggestions for improvement. And then finally, you want to end on a positive note when you give feedback, um, you encourage, um, and you can guide the, the students through that with, with another student's paper or with a paper that, that you write yourself or that you find online. 
Um, just as I did earlier with modeling how to use the templates, the rhetorical templates, you can do the same with modeling how to uh, provide peer written peer feedback. Um, and you do it together, you talk about it together, and then the teacher writes it down and the students uh, take it, take down what you wrote in notes and then they proceed to do the activity on their own. Um, so, and there are many, many other ways that you can use uh, writing to support reading, to support vocabulary, to support speaking. Um, there's all sorts of, uh, of scholarly work that focuses on this research, um, experimental research of all kinds. Um, and so the, it, it is sort of besides Graham and Hebert, it has been widely studied, the idea that um, that writing supports many other skills. Oh, another one. Um, so journal writing, um, you know, I talked about how um, writing is a way of slowing down speech and it really helps, um, you know, with with grammar and vocabulary, and it can also help with speaking. Journal writing is not academic writing, but journal writing um, can be a way to sort out your ideas, and in some ways that can help to improve speaking, and there is evidence for that. Finally, Graham and Hebert recommend extensive writing. Um, in other words, more writing, okay? So there's extensive writing and extended writing, and they're related. So extensive writing is lots of writing all the time. Extended writing, not just little writings, but longer pieces of writing. Uh, sometimes you can't do it all. Uh, so um, you might have to do writing every single day. It might not be 10 pages of writing, but maybe just one or maybe one paragraph, but you're doing it every day. And regardless, all of that repeated writing um, does contribute to fluency and, and helps to reduce writing anxiety, which for many students is half the battle, just getting them to want to write um, by just developing a, a habit of asking students to write daily can be very helpful. Um, so again, the, the, this is an activity, this, uh, this extended writing is an activity that supports uh, reading um, and speaking. One way that I, in my current classes, even with, with freshmen, college freshmen, that I get students to write um, regularly is through what I call, I, well, it's called, um, Peter Elbow called it, uh, low stakes writing assignments. Um, and these, these are great um, as a way to kind of warm students up for class discussion, for example. Um, they're writing activities that, you know, other people aren't going to scrutinize, you're not gonna have to revise, your teacher's not gonna read it and make comments on it or anything. They're just meant to help students think about a topic through writing without pressure. Um, Peter Elbow talks about it as, um, he says, the goal of low stakes writing isn't so much good writing as coming to learn, understand, remember, and figure out what you don't yet know. Even though low stakes writing to learn is not always good as writing, it is particularly effective at promoting learning and involvement in course material and it is much easier on teachers, especially those who aren't writing teachers, because um, you're not going to have to read it. You don't have to do a whole lot of planning for it. Um, I've used it in, a, in several ways. So I use it before class discussion, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I have students interpret and respond, for example, to a quoted pa uh, passage or some kind of video clip um, or a picture um, related to the topic of, of the day's class. So it's sort of like a warm up. Um, I sometimes use these low stakes writing assignments during class when I'm trying to teach um, writing like grammar or style. I might have like an example of a beautifully written sentence that some somebody wrote in an article, let's say, and have students imitate the same structure. Uh, just like with the templates, you might have, you know, the writing of somebody else as its own template and have students imitate that. And that can be a lot of fun. Um, and it's then the conversations that come out of what they produce can be very instructive um, and can help students with vocabulary and grammar and all of those things. Or I might ask students to write an extended definition of, of a word, a new word that they're not familiar with or an idea. 
Um, they might provide a, a dictionary definition and then provide some kind of a, a personal example uh, that, uh, that helps to illustrate the definition. Um, so another activity that we often, well, we don't use enough of and actually can have many benefits. So a writing activity that can benefit listening um, is dictation. And maybe some of you use dictation. I, uh, for a long time, just thought it was old fashioned. And then I realized that for someone who is uh, learning the language, it, it can be useful. You just have to um, structure it in a way that's interesting and varied up. Don't always do, you know, the traditional word list that you read out loud and they write down like a spelling test. Um, and um, in an article by Kiani and Shira Mary, there's an interesting a procedure that might be kind of interesting that you can use um, where students are using dictation to refine their, their um, writing and listening skills. So the way it works, first students are made aware of the topic of, of a passage or a conversation that activates their, their background knowledge. Um, they then listen to the whole passage or conversation without any pauses. Um, second, they play the audio. I mean, this was a tape, but we can call it audio nowadays because it's all digital. Uh, the audio was replayed and, and stopped after each meaningful chunk. And then students wrote that down. So it might be that meaningful chunk could be a sentence or it could be a part, a clause, um, you know, just as much as, as, as students can write in one, you know, in one go. And then in the third stage of this dictation activity, uh, the students listen again to the whole passage or conversation to check what they had written. And then afterwards, they check their writing against the script in their textbook or the script that you provide for them that they can check it against. Um, and then sometimes after checking their dictation, um, they, they can listen to it yet again while, uh, while looking at the dictation and paying attention to their mistakes. So um, just giving students this sort of scaffolded opportunity to, to listen, write, check, um, even talk about the mistakes that they made um, can in and of itself be very helpful um, to improve listening. And I would also add grammar and vocabulary um, and even reading. So now, how can writing specifically support grammar and vocabulary learning? So I've touched on how it can help with reading and how it can help with um, peripherally uh, with, with vocabulary and grammar, but directly, how can it? Um, how can writing support grammar and vocabulary learning? So a balanced literacy program combines incidental learning and explicit instruction. Um, a balance, so balanced literacy will involve also the lower level and the higher level skills, as I mentioned earlier, but it also involves you know, exposing students to a lot of rich language, as well as teaching them about that rich language. Um, our adult ESL students experience, they're immersed in English outside the classroom, most of them, right? Um, and that's often for them a kind of incidental learning. Um, and although the definition of incidental learning focuses mostly on input or exposure to language, we might also think of incidental learning as occasions in which the students are required to use vocabulary or grammar while writing or interacting naturally with others. So, um, so, in, so inc incidental learning, exposure, but I would argue also production, just unplanned production that you just have to spontaneously um, come up with. Of course, we know that simply being exposed to language isn't enough for adults to achieve the level of proficiency that is expected in college or for, for jobs that pay a living wage, right? So therefore, instructors also have to teach vocabulary and grammar explicitly by bringing new language to students' attention or explaining underlying rules and giving them opportunities to practice. Um, those opportunities can involve um, focus on forms with an S, as you see in that second column where explicit instruction is, um, or focus on forms. So I associate focus on forms with that capital S with traditional decontextualized vocabulary um, and grammar practice exercises, 
whereas the latter focus on form generally I think of as um, using grammar and vocabulary in in context uh, in the context of use we know from research that time spent on writing and process writing, especially if vocabulary is taught explicitly in the pre-writing stages, um, support, okay, supports vocabulary learning. Um, Lee provides a useful lesson structure for using explicit instruction to support vocabulary learning through writing. This explicit instruction may involve first focus on forms, whereby teachers introduce new words and have students complete writing exercises. Then, students can read and discuss an article that includes and requires the use of target words, respectively. After that, the instructor can ask students to write a composition on the topic of the article, which will also involve using the target words. And then finally, the teacher and or students, other students, can offer feedback on the use of the target vocabulary in the new writing products. Um, you can use that the same procedure when it comes to grammar. The problem is that often papers can have so many grammar or vocabulary errors that we just don't have the time to address all of them, which makes some teachers who feel, you know, feel anxious because they may feel like they're depriving their students of important learning opportunities. And so for this reason, I think it's important to talk about what to prioritize when you are offering feedback. Um, so what type and how much feedback um, are we to provide um, so that students can benefit? Um, one way I have dealt with, um, with how to prioritize grammar issues is by basically making the notion of clarity as my standards. So I intervene with feedback when I can't make sense of a student sentence. So in other words, when it's not readable or when it just takes too much imagination to figure out what the student is trying to say. Um, it, it's, it, I think in adult ESL that's that's reasonable. You might have a lot, a lot of of sentences that you can read perfectly fine, but they're not they don't have a lot of accurate grammar, um, and there's just too many of them. And so you just have to hone in. What I would suggest is that you just hone in on the ones where you just can't make sense of them. Um, in my own research, I found that generally these kinds of problems fall into these different categories that I've posted here. Um, I won't go into them for the sake of brevity, um, but if you want to discuss them further, uh, please do mention it and we can talk about it in the online forum. Um, so just one, for example, like vocabulary, a, a misused word, word choice, um, you know, a misused uh, idiom or, you know, when somebody overuses a thesaurus and finds a synonym that has, that's really not appropriate, that can really throw you off and not understand what a student is trying to say. Um, and so in, that is one instance where you definitely want to provide feedback. Um, so once I flagged an unclear sentence or passage, then I have to decide how am I going to respond? And when do I ask students to make their own corrections? When do I make the corrections? Um, and for this, I've often referred to the work of Dana Ferris. She has a wonderful work on error correction and error feedback. Um, and her work on how to handle writing errors in general, depend, she says that it depends on the nature of the error and whether they fall under the treatable categories, which are errors that are rule governed and can be corrected with a grammar checker or by looking up a set of rules, or the other category of non-treatable errors, which are those that are from just, you know, they result from the idiosyncrasies of the English language and like idioms and certain vocabulary words where you just, you know, it's like it's not something that you can teach a rule about because it's it's just very unpredictable. Um, those impediments to clarity that I pointed out in the last slide can include some of these treatable and non-treatable errors. Um, so I have to deal with those differently as they come up in the student's writing. So problems with clarity that consist of treatable errors can be pointed out to students, but you can let students try to figure out how to correct them on their own. Um, so if it's, you know, like a subject verb agreement type of thing, you can maybe, you can underline it um, and have them correct it. Uh, if you haven't taught that, that particular rule, you might make a note of it. And if several students are making the same 
mistake, then that's an opportunity for you to you to treat to teach the whole class about this particular type of subject verb agreement. Um, that now direct feedback is, is a little bit different. So when you have those non-treatable errors, um, that you know with vocabulary or particular idioms, um, for example, it, you can't just teach the rule. You you really just have to suggest a different word. Um, and you just, you know, you might explain why one, you know, the word that you're suggesting is more appropriate. Um, and in the process, just, you know, help students understand that not all of the terms recommended in a thesaurus are equivalent or are equal. So if we agree that writing can provide many language learning benefits, how then do we motivate students at all levels to write? Um, so we may think writing work, it, it, you know, is important, but not all students are into writing. And so how do we motivate them? Um, let's remember that writing is about more than learning vocabulary and grammar. Um, it's also a way to communicate ideas and experiences and that even if our students don't have the English language skills to express everything they want to say precisely and accurately, they can add, they can still add benefit from expressing themselves in writing. And one of the problems is that, you know, if we if we just focus on error correction and grammar and sentence, you know, uh, grammar exercises or close exercises, you know, we're not giving students enough opportunity to express themselves. And that can be very demotivating. Um, so one way to motivate is to to tap into what's called multi competence, students multi competence by focusing on more than just reading and writing. Um, and we know that in the 21st century, literacy requires more than just traditional reading and writing. Um, we can incorporate digital media, uh, all sorts of visuals, you know, memes and um, comics, uh, dramatic performance. There, there's so much out there that we can use, that we can combine with writing to help students communicate a message. And what that means is that if you have a, a, like a, a lower level student, um, and they're not able to write a paragraph to express an idea, they might be able to use an image, for example, to complement their writing and in that way communicate a fuller message. Um, so they may only be able to write three words, you know, a really short sentence to describe a picture. But, you know, a picture say, says it's a thousand words. So by incorporating that picture, then you're giving them you know, you're sort of tapping into their greater ability to communicate ideas, even if they are not yet ready to do that in extended writing. Um, and we have to also remember that writing is more motivating if it's not just done for the sake of writing, right? So, oh, we're doing, you know, we're not just doing writing because the teacher is asking you to do it. We want to do it for, for a reason that, that matters to the students. So thinking outside of the box and incorporating authentic purposes for writing will usually involve, as I mentioned earlier, some kind of digital media. Instructors can have students, for example, write an email to their child's teacher or create an advertisement for, you know, their their cleaning services or lawn mowing services or whatever services they want to provide. Um, even teaching students to interact on social media platforms, um, which will be a lesson that I will um, include in our forum discussion. We're going to talk about that, how to create a lesson around social media. That can provide authentic and motivating, motivating reasons for writing. Um, so just you know, think about ways that you can incorporate writing that students will find exciting and meaningful and that can um, allow them to express themselves even if they're at the very beginning levels, okay? They don't, they don't have to write a novel to convey meaning. They can write two words accompanied by a picture or uh, accompanied by some kind of an, an audio, a, a song or something. And that, at least at that level, could be sufficient and motivating. Okay, so as we conclude this section, um, there's just some general tips for connecting reading and writing. I'm sorry, I think I used the wrong presentation. I was, I had, uh, these, th these were divided up, but now they're all kind of in one slide. Um, quickly, I just want sort of to reiterate some of the important points. Um, when you are teaching writing, use speaking, use visual aids, activate 
background knowledge, use students' multi-competence, what they bring with them to stimulate ideas for writing and to motivate them to write. Um, encourage students to use grammar that you've taught, vocabulary from readings. When writing and speaking, holding them accountable for that can, can be very helpful. Have students write more, uh, write often and more to develop fluency and give them feedback as needed um, to help them improve with accuracy, with grammar. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, remember there's indirect feedback and direct feedback. So you might have to offer the correction or you might um, point out the error and give them an opportunity to make the correction. Um, then you also want to be explicit in your teaching strategies when it comes to writing when, when, you know, and reading. So when they're reading, you want to teach how to look for main idea. You want to teach them to self-monitor, to read and read again, to look up unfamiliar words. Um, and then in writing, you can teach them brainstorming, how to map ideas, how to take notes. Just be explicit. I mean, these are sort of in addition to what I mentioned in the presentation. Um, but keep in mind that don't take for granted that they're going to know these things. Um, teach students to read like writers. Um, so when I give you the example of um, the activity that I do with students where I make them, I give them a sample sentence that someone wrote, you know, you know just a lovely sentence that somebody wrote in an article or a book or whatever, and I have them imitate that, that's reading like a writer. That's looking at how writers write and trying to write that way yourself. Um, and that can also be a good way to... Um, to improve your writing. And it doesn't have to be at the sentence level. It can also be at the at the sort of at the discourse level, meaning like you can look at how how a writer might organize their ideas. Um, I'm sure most of you do this. I do this where if you are asked to write something that you've never written before, some kind of a special document, you go online and you look for examples and then you're like, oh, well, in this section, I'm supposed to write an introduction or in this section, I'm supposed to provide statistics and in this. Well, in the same way, we can teach them how to how to learn from other people's texts as they in order to guide them in writing their own texts. Um, and that idea also falls into the category of model texts. So either they see you writing or they they have um, an example of the kind of writing that you want to do and they can look at that and imitate that. That also can be a great way to scaffold writing assignments. Um, sentence frames um, that I mentioned earlier with the, those templates, um, they teach rhetorical moves, such as introducing a topic, disagreeing with a perspective, comparing ideas. Use that as well. Um, remember to teach lower order skills in context. So do not, you know, it's, it's not that effective to just do the old fashioned language uh, sort of grammar syllabus where you're just, you know, your entire course is based on, you know, first we're going to do the be verbs, then we're going to do the have, and then we're going to do, it, it's much more helpful to teach in context. And I, you know, that's something that adult ESL does so well. Um, and I think we're often reminded not to do the old fashioned syllabus, but from what I've observed, I think most adult ESL teachers already know that they need to teach these skills in context. So it's just a reminder or maybe validation for you what you already do. And then increase motivation by writing for authentic purposes, not just for, for you, not, for, not just for school purposes, but also to get things done outside at work and in other aspects of their lives. That can be very um, motivating to students. So as um, that's it. And if you guys are interested in reading some of the materials that I use to prepare this presentation, there's a list of references at the end of um, of this PowerPoint uh, presentation. Um, you can also ask me uh, for additional resources and I can suggest some for you. Um, not just academic articles, but also textbooks or any other materials that I have used. Um, I've learned quite a bit about the teaching of writing since I left adult ESL. I think a lot of what I did when I taught adult ESL uh, was based on my own experience as a, as a writer in K-12 and just a little bit of experience as an adult, uh, as an ESL, um, college ESL teaching assistant. But a lot of what I've learned, I've learned since I've started teaching freshman students. Um, and I've got lots of lots of tools and and um, and skills that I can share with you if if you have any additional questions.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This was just amazing. Um, so many great suggestions. So we have a few questions that have been posed and we have a little time. So I will um, read the question for you. Okay. So Elizabeth asks, how do you manage? This is a question that we all struggle with a lot. Um, and I think we can do a lot more during the online discussion related to this question. But how do you um, manage all the levels of ESL in the same classroom? It's not easy to divide the group. Even the advanced ESL want to learn what is taught to the lower students, making it hard to, to advance the, the higher level students. So the, the uh, perpetual question that, that we all struggle with. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, I mean, it's, it's, you know, when somebody comes up with the perfect answer, let me know. But um, I, I know that what I have done, um, what I do now, my levels are not as, as wide as they were in adult ESL. Um, but I did this in adult ESL where, you know, that opportunity for peer work and collaborative work can be very helpful for the lower level students. But as you suggest, it's not, it's not enough to advance the other students, right? So you might have a, a more advanced student giving feedback um, and supporting and doing collaborative activities with the more basic student. Um, and then, where, you know, where's the advanced student, like where's their support? And so what, I know that there's limited time um, in adult ESL, we don't get planning time. We, most of us work part-time. I know, I know that's, you know, the, the field is, full of part-time teachers who have other jobs and other responsibilities. So you try to do as much as you can during class time. So one thing that I that I often did, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to, um, to get classrooms that had computers, you know, so either like a computer lab or, um, or some kind of classroom that had a few computers. And what I would often do is I would give students a task that uh, some kind of a writing task or a research task that they could do independently while I went around and specifically worked with those advanced students. Um, and so with them, I would address, you know, the, you know, I, I, I did the whole, the, I usually did that strategy of identifying the clarity issues in their papers and then working with them through those issues. Um, with the lower level students, I had first, you know, the, the advanced students work with them and sort of that was a first pass. And then I would just, you know, I would have to go through those papers and really, again, think about how I was going to prioritize um, my feedback because I just couldn't, you just can't, you don't have time to do everything, right? So, I mean, it could be that also that there's, there's clarity, but, you know, you, you flag clarity, but there's just so many. Um, and you might just have to start with like just the basics of constructing a sentence and starting and asking students to just like maybe revise, revise a few sentences to imitate the particular type of sentence that you want them to learn. Um, so you have to be creative. It's very time consuming. There's no way around it. Uh, you can leverage the, the higher skills of the upper level students. Uh, but then that leaves those upper level students also needing, you know, very, very targeted feedback from you so that they too are advancing. I hope that Excellent. answers your question. Oh yeah, there, those are some really good suggestions. Um, one thing that I would add to that, Rebecca, is with the sentence frames and that you showed us and one can also provide paragraph frames for the lower level students. Yes. So to provide them with more support and more structure and less support for the students at the higher levels. So that's something that could be incorporated, I think, into in a multi-level situation. Yes, so here's right. another question that I thought was a really great one. Um, Ahuva asks how to deal with the tendency for many learners to be tied to their um, translation devices. Great to write. question. Great question. Well, I think one one way that I've disabused a lot of my students from doing that is, you know, when they see how many how many false translations they get out of those, they start to realize, wait a minute, there there's only so much they can do for me, you know. Um, so I think that's one of them. And then um, the other, and I, you know, this is something that I would only recommend for maybe the upper level students, but I, you know, 
you have to be really um, strategic in how you teach it. I use a lot of, uh, I use the Amer the Corpus of American, the, it's called COCA, Corpus of, of Contemporary American English. And it's this really great database that allows you to input, for example, particular words or structures, um, formulaic uses of language. And it then provides all kinds of real life examples um, in how those phrases or words or structures are used. And then from there, students are able to infer rules. Um, so I would say that in addition to using or instead of using a thesaurus, a better way uh, or a dictionary or a translator, a better way, a better thing that they can, a better way that they can use external devices is to learn how to how to analyze language in the way that something like a corpus allows you to do. Um, because you see how the actual language is used in context and all the different um, meanings that words can have. Um, and to me, that's not that's not an over reliance. That's actually a very useful skill. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just just have to point out that how inaccurate some of these can be. Um, and that that can be at least from what I've experienced, that can be a way to disabuse them of the constant urge to look for, you know, uh, synonyms and translations and all that. What do you think, Susan? Do you have other ideas? Uh, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. <laughs> for that. Yeah, especially especially helping them to see uh, how it can mislead them uh, uh, it, often. So yeah, just pointing that out in and of itself, I think is really helpful. So we are close to the end of our time. Um, there's one other question here that, and, and there are lots of kudos, Rebecca, so thanking you for a wonderful webinar today. Um, one question asked by Camille, she's teaching HSC and she believes that the writing recommendations will be helpful in her class. What methods can I use to create more enthusiasm for writing? <laughs> um, I, 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 okay, so I once taught this uh, wonderful, it was so much fun. I did a newspaper course. It may not sound like anything terribly innovative, because um, I know there's lots of adult ESL teachers that do some really cool stuff. I mean, teachers that have students do uh, create like uh, cookbooks and and like plays and all kinds. I mean, I've seen all sorts of creative stuff in, in the field. Um, but I, I do feel like project based work can be very motivating. Um, and so this this one course I taught was it was called the newspaper course. And yeah, we did. You know, students got to pick. Um, what what parts of the new of, of the of the paper of the newspaper they were going to be in charge of and of course like a lot of guys wanted to do like the sports section and a lot of women wanted to do like features and some people wanted to do just like current events and just like having to to produce something that then other people were going to read right so like they were aware that i was going to share that newspaper with other people in the program. So that also was very motivating because they wanted to do it well. Um, so I'm all for project-based work, you know, coming up with something that like they're gonna actually use or they're gonna present it to somebody. Um, I feel like that can be very motivating, even with, um, you know, the traditional students, not the ESL students, um, who might just, you know, they may, they may think they're just the worst writers in the world. You know, one thing I remember, I had this really wonderful student who used to write rap music. That was his life. That was like, he had, he was so prolific. He had all kinds of verses that he had written. And we spent a lot of time like having him talk about his work and trying to communicate with us what he was trying to um, convey with it. And it was incredibly motivating. Why? Because it was his work and it was something that was important to him. Um, so in whatever way you can tap, even if you don't like rap music, even if you don't like whatever it is out there in like popular media that they're into, if you can, if you can use that to learn, then, then, you know, that will be very motivating. Yeah, I would definitely, that's fantastic. Um, I think one of the couple of things that I've done that have been highly, highly motivating for learners is having them create photo stories 
So they write a script, they add photos, you can use different, um, you know, digital platforms for this, and they narrate the stories. So it goes through an iterative process where they're writing drafts, they're getting feedback through peer review, the way you suggested, Rebecca. Also, I think podcasting, having students oh, write yes. podcasts mm -hmm. on topics that are of interest can mm -hmm. be incredibly motivating for them. So that's just a couple of ideas. Um, we are really close to the end of our time now, and we have, we still have some great questions. So I'm so looking forward now to continuing our discussion online next Monday and Tuesday. So I hope everybody will join us. And several people have posted great suggestions to the rest of us in the field. So I'm hoping that they will uh, join us and post those same suggestions on the discussion next week. So I cannot thank you enough, Rebecca. I'm looking forward to next week. And thank you so much for today. It's been fantastic. And uh, I want to turn it over, I think, to Megan to wrap things up. Thank you. And yes, thank you, Rebecca. Um, this was great. As Susan said, please join us on links for the discussion starting on Monday. Um, and if you don't have a links account, please sign up for one, they're free, and there's a ton of great resources and discussions happening, and activities happening all the time. I put a link to the survey in the chat box. So please fill out that survey. Um, we'd love to get your feedback on today's session. And if you have any other questions or anything else you wanna let us know about, feel free to get in touch. Um, you can email, there's, a, there's an email that comes with the GoToWebinar and that will get you in touch with us here. I think that's it. Thanks so, everyone for coming. Oh, go ahead. So just one one more comment real quick. There was a question about um, whether the recording would be available. And Me Megan, I understand we'll be sending out the link to the recording when it's available. Is that correct? That's right. So that can take some time because we have to make it um, web accessible. But there will be a recording and that will get sent out to the whole registration link when it's available. All right, we'll look forward to seeing everybody online. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Megan, for the tech support. And thank you once again, Rebecca. We'll look forward to next week. Bye-bye, everybody. See you guys next week. Thanks, Bye. everyone.